online after. So if you're not comfortable with the recording, um, you should be fine. We're not doing any audio from anyone. We'll do a question and answer after Tara's uh, presentation, uh, but we'll try and do a video uh, audio transcript, um, and I'll try and um, get that typed up as well for the group. So I'm Keely Nixon. Um, I'm a farmer myself on the West Coast as well as a community organizer. I've been working with FarmLink as well as other land access groups um, to work on this new platform that FarmLink's just launched. If you haven't checked it out, I'd really encourage you um, to take a look. FarmLink's been going for about eight years and um, with this new platform we launched two weeks ago, we're able to offer much more uh, listing services, so it's farmlink.net. Um, we will have more information on the webinar series. This is our number, our first webinar um, on the operation strategies. There's three others that are going to be happening. Uh, they're every two weeks now until March. Uh, our registration has been incredible. So if you haven't um, haven't registered, I'd encourage you to register now, and we'll try and get it. We can kind of cap at 100. So if you haven't registered, uh, get your get your name in there. Um, there'll be uh, many things that Tara's going to reference today including the farm readiness uh, worksheet, which some of you may have um, heard me mention already. Um, if you didn't see it come through on the MailChimp newsletter Saturday, I'm putting the link in the message uh, box right now um, just to download it. It's not essential for today's work, but we want to have it as um, a background sort of resource for some self-assessment. Um, again, just to note, this is going to be available online after, and some of the resources Tara will mentioned are also on the FarmLink resource database. Um, so, without further ado, our presenter is Tara Young. She's doing this whole series for us. We're so excited to have Tara. She's been someone who's been a real farm crush of mine for many years. So, Tara, we're so happy to have you. Uh, Tara runs Green Bean Farm in Ontario with her husband. The farm's producing vegetables as well as pastured pork, poultry eggs, grass-fed lamb, and beef. They're devoted to embodying organic and humane principles while remaining economically viable, which many of us that know is very difficult in small-scale farming. Uh, Tara holds a degree in environmental biology at the University of Guelph, teaches livestock husbandry for Fleming College Sustainable Agriculture. And with that, Tara, I'm going to turn it over to you so you can introduce the topic and launch right into it. And um, just so everyone notes, we do have your speakers, uh, your mics muted and your video. We encourage you to mute your video so um, we have the best feed for all our participants. Thank you so much. We're so happy to be here can today. Can you hear me? Looks like you can. Okay, good. Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. I am going to go pretty quickly. Um, there's a lot in this slide deck that I would like to go through. Um, this is a, it's a one hour talk about production. It's the goal of these, these uh, little webinars is basically to expose you to the FarmLink website to give you uh, a sense of what's available there to assist you in your exploring or your planning process. I can't actually give you a whole lot of meat uh, in these in these webinars, um, but hopefully the, the things I touch on today will will uh, act as catalysts for you as you move forward in your own uh, explore exploration or, or planning. So. Um, there's the FarmLink website. We will uh, definitely visit it a couple times during this talk. Uh, just a, This is by way of an introduction about me. Green Being Farm is the name of my farm. Um, you can see a few of the, the things that we produce there. We produce pretty much everything. Um, red pole, grass-fed beef, grass-fed lamb, heritage hens, uh, meat birds, pastured pork. Um, we also produce uh, vegetables for little over a hundred families for consumption during the winter so things like potatoes squash uh, we have three greenhouses where we do pastured, um, pastured passive solar uh, greenhouse production all winter long there's a shot of our root cellar and uh, we are one of the only produce uh, breeders of kuni kuni pigs in the country uh, which is a, a pig that has a remarkable ability to finish on pretty much nothing but pasture which from an ecological perspective, I find very, um, very exciting. And there you go. So, um, Kelia already mentioned the Farm Readiness Workbook, and um, this is a great, very concise um, little workbook for you. And, and it is basically designed to get you to a point where it, it forces you to ask the questions, you know, are you ready to pursue a career in farming? If you're still at the explorer stage, you may um, realize that you are not. You you actually will 
come out of this realizing, you know what, maybe it, this is not for me. And that is fine. I, I have taught uh, four day, five day workshops just on the exploration stage. And half of the people come out of that realizing it's not a good career choice. And it's a very good thing to realize, you know, before you go out and buy the farm. Um, if you do believe that you want to pursue farming for a career, uh, there are some really important questions you need to ask yourself and be very clear, not only with yourself, but with any um, life and business partners. Um, what are your core values? What are your quality of life goals? And what are your financial um, needs? Uh, what do you need to make from this farm business in order to um, meet your other goals in life? So uh, if you have not completed that workbook yet um, and you've never done anything of the kind, um, please don't sell yourself short. This, these webinars are, are almost going to be, in, you know, not they're not going to be useful to you unless you've taken the time to really think about yourself uh, and what's important to you and, and really just set the foundations for a, a good farm plan. So that obviously today is operations and the next uh, three you can see are, are listed there, marketing, financial management, loans and financing. So uh, operations, uh, the, the big question to start with, of course, is what will you produce? And this is usually uh, one of the easier questions for people to answer. Most of you, if you're a planner, probably have a few ideas in mind about what, what is um, attractive to you. And some of you, as I can see in the chat box, um, are already producing things. So that's great. I think it's important to take a step back once you've really thought about your core values and your quality of life goals and your financial needs to ask the question again um, and through the, the filters of, of these um, kind of core, core questions. Um, so I wanted to, you know, obviously you're just going back a moment, the sky is the limit for what you can produce. Um, and maybe you have an idea already. If you're thinking of doing more than one thing, uh, first of all, recognize that as a new farmer, um, diversity, over diversification can be uh, a real business killer. It, it's very dangerous when, you get in, when you're getting into farming to over diversify. Um, and so when, if you do think you'd like to do more than one enterprise on your farm, that's fine, but be very, um, be very smart in terms of choosing your various enterprises. Uh, one concept to consider is that of centerpiece and complementary enterprises. Um, if you have a center, the, the idea is choose one enterprise that's the focal point of your farm. And then if you're going to have more than one enterprise, think about what would be complementary. And so make use of um, additional or existing infrastructure that you already have. Uh, figure out what the low work times are on your farm and try to fill those instead of doubling up on your workload at certain times of the year. Spread out your cash flow. Um, you know, do you have a way to bring more customers to you with a complimentary enterprise? Or do you already have a customer base with, with your centerpiece enterprise and could you spread those purchases could you spread those, you know, could you get those customers to buy more of the same thing? So for example, uh, we, we do a lot of pastured meats. The last thing that we added to the farm was grass-fed beef. It was super easy because we already had a fence. Um, we already had truckers in a relationship with an abattoir. We already had a customer base for pastured meats. And so it was very easy to find a market for this other um, enterprise. The... Um, so if you say you want to do a market garden, but you're thinking of other enterprises, well, how will they mesh in a way that's really synergistic? Um, pigs, for example, could be one that could make use of the waste uh, that comes off of a vegetable farm and turn it into meat. Um, if you are going to a weekly market or a CSA, eggs are a really good enterprise in terms of spreading out your customer purchases because um, you can bring your eggs every week to your CSA or, or your market. And uh, lamb, well that's one that we have on our farm that meshes really well with our vegetables because uh, every time we do a cover crop, before we work that in, we let the sheep go, go over and graze it down, thus adding fertility to the, to the, to the garden land. So that's uh, centerpiece and complementary enterprises. 
That idea came from the book You Can Farm, which was written by Joel Salatin. And if you're not familiar with Joel Salatin, uh, probably you are if you're already involved in, in agriculture in any way. But uh, definitely make yourself familiar with his work. And um, in, in his book You Can Farm, which is a, it's a good book, um, he lists all of, you know, a whole bunch of things which he thinks are characteristics of successful enterprises. And um, I, I think these are very, very good. Low initial startup cost relative to the ability to generate income. So how, how quickly after you make your investment will you be seeing, will you be making money? Uh, high, high gross profit margin, low maintenance, high cash flow relative to expenses, history of high success rate among new enterprises, high demand, low supply, high product distinctiveness. So will your product stand out in the marketplace uh, and relatively size neutral profit potential. So even if you're small, will you be profitable or do you have to get to a certain size in order for that enterprise to make any money? So um, for example, uh, uh, salad greens. Salad greens would, would pretty much tick every box on this list. Um, turnaround time is very fast between when you plant those seeds and when you, you have a high and uh, very valuable crop. Something like uh, beef or um, even lamb, something like that, does not necessarily tick all these boxes. It doesn't mean they're, they're not going to be successful, but as a startup enterprise, they are a lot more challenging. In terms of... Um, you know, and I touched on this before, when you're choosing what you're going to produce, this is super important. How do your product choices align with your financial goals, your quality of life goals, and your core values? Have you figured out what strengths you bring to your business? But also what weaknesses do you have? And what um, opportunities are there in the marketplace? And also what are, what are the threats in the marketplace? And those are, um, Oh, for example, if, if you want to get into meat production, uh, but you're in a part of Canada where um, there's been a lot of closures of, of small abattoirs, well, that's a real threat for your business, obviously. Uh, and that's sort of, it's an external thing. It's not about you personally or your farm. It's, it's external. So that's what I mean by threats. All of this is explained in the Farm Readiness Workbook. Um, another, another really good, I don't know if this will work. Ah! Uh, this is Holistic Management. It's a, a really good uh, book to help you kind of work through all of these goals as well. I would really recommend either reading it or signing up for a workshop. Um, now I'm just going to do something now and every time I do it I kind of forget how. Um, I'm going to share my, my, um, my screen with you. <laughs> and I'm going to take you to, and please type in the box if, if you can't hear me, but uh, I'm about to share my screen with you. We're going to go to the um, uh, website. Okay. <laughs> All right, I think you can see my screen. We're not on the right page. Let's go to the internet. Um... Okay, um, I think you're here on the FarmLink website with me, and great site, and, and basically this has been put together to help all of you find all of the resources that uh, you'll require to answer all of these questions. So if you go to resources, um, and you go to the resource data pay database, I'm just going to click on the search bar, so this is what you'll this is what you'll see. If, if I were to put um, self-assessment in the box, in the search box, what comes up uh, are a whole bunch of ways to assess yourself and assess your farm plans and see if you've got what it takes to be a farmer. So questionnaires um, and tools for evaluating farm enterprises. There's another one just while we're here. Um, if I were to put in enterprise selection as an example, um, farm planning, enterprise selection, and exploring the fa small farm dreams. So if I click on that and I go down to view, 
there you go. This is quite an extensive. It's 50 pages all about figuring out, um, you know, if, if you really do want to run a farm and how to, how to help with enterprise selection decisions. Okay. Um, so that all of this kind of stuff is available from the, the farm link dot net website. And if you, you don't know what you want to type in, well, just go down the long list of tags and you know click on a box and see what's available. So just within the business stuff, you've got goal setting, you've got farm viability. So there's there's all kinds of meat here. Um, really, the, the the really what I want everybody to know in taking this webinar is that there's just such a such a condensed amount of information on this website that um, hopefully you can all take advantage of. All right. So I think that went well. I think I managed to uh, share my screen with you. All right. Look, yeah, and I missed that question. Sorry, it is by Alan Savory, but uh, holistic management. But you saw that. Very good. Okay. Um, bum bum bum. So moving on. So let's say that um, you have, uh, and you should see the slides again, please let me know if you don't, but uh, let's say you've, you've figured out what it is you want to do on your farm. So that's great. Um, and it aligns with your financial goals, your quality of life goals, your core values, it uh, plays to your strengths, it um, circumvents your weaknesses, that, that kind of thing. So um, before you can really, um, just go out and do it, start producing, uh, before you can create real production plans, the, what you should make sure you have prior to that are production skills and knowledge. Um, and sometimes it is it is a bit more streamlined. A lot of us go out and, and get a quite a broad education in farming and then realize what it is we want to do, but if, if you're coming at it from the other way and you don't have a lot of production skills but you think you know what it is you want to do, well then you can really focus your education on on uh, you know the enterprises that you're interested in. Um, so how do you build production skills and knowledge? Uh, I see that there's a, a fair amount of planners in the group and that's great so I would assume that you've already done some work building production skills. If you're still in the explorer stage this should be um, you know start, 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 underline, underline. You have to make sure that uh, you know what you're doing before you, you invest a whole lot of money uh, into land and infrastructure. Um, just to drive the point home, uh, most of you, if you have careers already, probably didn't just go out and start doing them. You've probably received uh, a certain amount of training. Well, there is there are very few um, jobs that I can think of that require such a diverse skill set than farming. Uh, it's one of the more challenging jobs that I that I could ever think of, and so for that reason, it's it's doubly and triply important to have some training under your belt before you uh, go out and do it on your own. It's it's arrogant to think that you can just go out and do this because you uh, read the permaculture book, or you uh, had you grew your grandparents had a farm, so it's in your blood. Like those are not that those aren't skills. Okay, uh, hopefully I'm I've belabored this enough. But uh, obviously ways to build production skills. Uh, go work on a farm. Really, just to know what it's like day in and day out. Uh, to see if you're really up for it, go work on a farm. Um, if you're not uh, even skilled enough to go work on a farm, or you want to have um, maybe a greater breadth of experience, uh, try a farm internship. A lot of farms offer them, just make sure you go to one where uh, you feel like you're actually getting quality education. Um, if you can't d dedicate enough, like a full season, to working on a farm or in taking an internship, you can always volunteer. There are also lots of workshops and farm tours being offered across the country. Um, and then of course there's formal education. There's If you just Google Sustainable Agriculture Education Canada, there's, there's a lot of schools offering formal education. Uh, of course there's the internet, conferences, books, all of that. But I would say that, you know, workshops, formal education, internet, conferences, those are all great, but they should be the icing on the cake. The cake being actual get your hands dirty on a real farm um, experience. Incidentally, uh, we we offer two internship uh, uh, opportunities at our farm. 
Uh, so if you're interested in spending a season with us, uh, you can check out our website. Um, so just a few screenshots of various organizations across the country uh, that offer, um, you know, you can go to goodwork.ca and learn about jobs all over the country. Um, Craft is um, a network of farms that offer internships. Linnea and Everdale actually offer an enhanced experience where you actually pay money to go and learn. Um, so that's great. There's also um, volunteer networks such as um, Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms or WOOF. And there are a lot of regional networks. So wherever you are in um, in Canada, there are small farm regional networks, practically every single province. So um, find out what's in your area. Uh, this is Shannon and Brian of Broad Fork Farm. Just a really quick case study. Uh, you know, they they started a farm in um, 2011, but prior to that, um, they both apprenticed, worked on a lot of different farms. Uh, they were interns. They were farm managers. Um, they incubated. Shannon spent over six years working on various farms all over the world. Um, Brian started out as an apprentice uh, and in his second year he's helping to run a 160 member CSA. After that he piloted his farm business uh, on an incubator farm and then in his fourth year he began um, Broad Fork Farm. So uh, you know again it takes some investment into your education and it will really pay off. Folks that I see that jump right into a farming career without actually working on a profitable farm, uh, they struggle. All right, so if you do um, feel like you are prepared, you have the necessary education and training, time has come, of course, to, um, to consider your operation strategy. You know, how will you produce the thing that it is that you would like to produce? Just a quick uh, clarification question. Somebody has asked, Joe's asked, what is meant by an incubator farm? Uh, it's a place where you can try out your own farm business on someone else's land. So what an amazing opportunity uh, before you have to invest all that money in land and infrastructure, you can actually try starting your business using somebody else's land and infrastructure. Uh, we offer an, incubate, an incubator opportunity on our farm and there are um, a small number throughout the, the country as well. Okay. Um, moving on. So, for every potential enterprise that you are considering, there is a checklist of things that you will want to be, uh, you know, spending a lot of time deliberating over. So, first one is production management. So, how is it that how will you be producing the thing you want to produce? Um, if we're talking vegetables or field crops, do you, do you know how to complete a crop rotation uh, or, or design a crop plan? Uh, what if it's livestock? Do you, do you know about, you know, what's, what's your grazing plan going to be like? Um, do you plan on carrying any kind of certification? That kind of thing. Um, those are all production management questions and we'll, we'll dig in a little bit deeper to that one. But also, something you should be thinking about before you go out and do anything what are the regulations uh, surrounding your enterprise? Um, what institutional requirements exist? Uh, how are you going to design a successful enterprise that will meet all of, of the, those requirements? And um, a great place to, you know, probably you're going, well, I don't know, how do I learn about what regulations exist? Go back to the FarmLink website and type in regulations into the search bar, and that's a, that'll, that's a very good starting point. Uh, resources. So what are the physical resource needs for your enterprise? And will you have enough access to things like land, fertility, water, um, what tools are required, what, machineries, what machinery is required, all of that kind of stuff. And we're just talking production right now, but when we get into budgeting, you know, you'll have to be able to associate, you know, put a price, price tag next to each of these items. Gaps. It's really, really, uh, it's actually quite empowering to be able to see your roadblocks before you get to them so that you can design a farm plan that circumvents them. Um, and so identifying them early, you know, what if you, you know, have access to land, but right now you don't think you're going to have enough water? Well, 
you don't want to realize that <laughs> when you've got thirsty crops in the ground. Okay, so um, how can you come? How can you come up with a risk mitigation plan? And there are actually work worksheets that you can find on farm on the FarmLink website just about developing plans for mitigating risk. Okay. Um, contingency plans really build resilience on your farm. Resilience is incredibly important. Um, so make sure you're addressing your gaps before you fall victim to them. Uh, size, you know, how much can you produce? Um, how much do you want to produce? How much should you produce? Those kinds of questions. And then how exactly do you plan on storing your inventory uh, so that the quality is maintained? What will be the cost of that, et cetera? So if we were going to be talking about pastured chicken, for example, uh, what are your production questions? Well, are we talking chicken tractors? Are we talking day range system? What exactly are the nuts and bolts of your production system? Uh, but then also questions like, do you plan on having them certified organic? That kind of thing. Uh, regulations. Well, pasture chicken is an example where there are quite a, quite a few regulations surrounding them. Uh, do you plan on purchasing quota? Every province is going to be different, so have you learned who the regulators are? Um, here in Ontario, there's a new artisanal chicken program, uh, which would allow you to raise up to a few thousand birds. You have to apply for that. Right, so are you aware of what the regulations are? You can't just go out and raise as many chickens as you want. Um, resources. What are the things you need in terms of shelter, feed, land, uh, that, that kind of stuff. Um, abattoir, big one. You know, interestingly, because of this new program in Ontario, there's a lot more chicken on the market, but there are no more abattoirs. And so, uh, you know, if you think you're producing pastured poultry in Ontario uh, this coming season and you don't have a slaughter date, I hate to, you know, you're in, you're in trouble. Uh, my abattoir is booked for the entire year. So that, that kind of stuff. It's good to have these things thought out well in advance. Um, gaps. Can you satisfy your market in the winter? Uh, what about a labor gap? Do you plan on having help during the summer? Uh, what happens in the winter? How are you going to keep those people around? Uh, capacity. Does your land base match your desired output, for example? Um, do you have the capacity in, time, in terms of time and energy? That's, that's a really important question as well. Storage and inventory. Well, what are the CFIA requirements in terms of, uh, first of all, transportation, uh, both live and dead birds? How will they be uh, safely transported to market? Uh, what are the, the temperature requirements? Those kinds of things. Okay. Part of a good operation strategy is just making sure you're aware of your workload as it varies from season to season. This also might help you in terms of developing um, a good complementary enterprise. So, you know, one thing that uh, we did on our farm, we have a few, we have maybe a few too many enterprises, but uh, they work really well together because uh, we We've spread the workload out uh, all year long. So uh, we're a winter CSA. We don't sell any vegetables in the summer. So all of my uh, washing, packing, distributing for vegetables takes place in the, um, in the winter months, meaning that I can do my entire, you know, we can grow $100,000 worth of food with one and a half staff. Uh, so that, and that's because we effectively spread uh, the workout year round. Um, and then creating a, a production, you know, an operation strategy should have, um, you know, what are all of the schedules that you're going to need, all of the different plans, the record keeping, all of that, that all comes under operations. So if it was a market garden you're interested in, um, you know, I have, a, I have an Excel file for my seed orders, um, greenhouse seeding schedule, transplanting schedules, direct seeding schedules, your field work schedule. Uh, could also be your labor schedule. Um, what's your crop rotation look like? Uh, what is your cover cropping uh, plan? Uh, what's your harvest log going to look like? How are you going to record your sales? How are you going to make sure you're taking care of all of your equipment? Do you have a schedule for that? Um, how do you um, how do you uh, log your inventory? Those are all the kind of things you're going to be wanting to think about as you develop production plans. If you, if you are just incidentally interested in market gardening, um, 
and you're not really sure you have the tools yet to, to create those kinds of plans, The Market Gardener is a relatively new book, uh, and it's Canadian, um, written by Jean-Martin Fortier, and uh, quite, quite a pretty much required reading at this point if you're going to be a market gardener. Uh, he runs Les Jardins de la Grelinette, and it's a small-scale, intensive, low-tech farming, and he has a lot of resources in his book uh, for people to use. In terms of record keeping, uh, you're only as good as your records, um, and especially if you're a new farmer, uh, you don't have the luxury of, you know, decades of, of experience behind you, maybe just soaking all, up all of this knowledge by osmosis. The more you can record um, so that you have it at your fingertips for following years, the, the better. So that, you know, your records can help you with uh, making management decisions, absolutely. But it, it's also going to help you with your um, cost, costing out your products, which we'll be talking about in, in future webinars. And also, um, if you want to get a loan at any point, having these records is incredibly important. Um, so let's try sharing another. We'll go. Let's here we go. Go back to the website. Uh, share my screen. Do, do, do. So here we are back at the um, FarmLink website. Forget what it was that I wanted to type in here, but let's assume it was record keeping. So I just ticked the box that said record keeping. And that's not true. <laughs> oh, I have to delete enterprise selection. So I'm just going to filter, use this filter option. Oh, look, there it is. So now rec all the record keeping um, resources pop up. Um, there's a simple record keeping system for fruit and vegetable production, revenue projections and profit potential of grass based livestock, profitable record keeping, keeping good records on a vegetable farm. That one's a webinar. So, again, lots of stuff available. Record keeping is rather personal, it uh, works in different ways for different people. Um, but it's, it's a really good idea to start by just seeing what's out there. Oh, thanks, Keely. <laughs> so, so there's the, the farm link, uh, the link to the resource database there for you. Okay. Um, great. So just, just as, an, as an example for my own operations, uh, say with my pasture chicken operation or my pasture pig, anything, um, I have a, a Excel file for every enterprise. And I document how long it takes me to do every task. So if, if it's chickens in the brooder, uh, moving chicken tractors, um, taking them to the abattoir, uh, taking them back from the abattoir, how long does it take me to market, how long does it take me to deliver. So I log all of the time required to do every task. I also document feed consumption, I document mortality, I, I document the cost of absolutely everything. Uh, from the feed scoop to the screws for my chicken tractors. Uh, if it's eggs, uh, I also log how many marketable eggs I get every day uh, so that I can compare that against feed consumption and that will feed into uh, figuring out the cost of, of my eggs. Um, it's, the, it's the one thing if you're starting out in farming everybody understands is important but nobody feels they actually do a very good job of. So I, uh, I really encourage you to dig into some of those resources on the FarmLink website so that as you start you create good record keeping habits because it's it's hard once you've started out, uh, it's easier if you start out with good habits. So production planning um, is really, it's a, it's a cycle, of course you start with the plan, um, planning is really fun, um, then you have to go out and execute your plan and actually do it. Um, and then when it's all said and done, you're going to be, um, well, you should keep records all year. Uh, so keeping your records and then looking at your records and assessing and doing some benchmarking. What benchmarking is, is really looking at your own records and comparing them to um, the industry um, standards. So for example, my, my, my chicken mortality, uh, what was it 
And is that good? Is that bad? You wouldn't know unless you did some benchmarking. And maybe you'll find out that actually your mortality is quite great or it's, it's awful and you got to figure out what's going on there. Um, I have a, a friend who's a bean farmer and uh, dry beans and he wasn't, he wasn't having um, great financial success. He, had his, he kept all of his records, but it wasn't until he did some benchmarking and realized, oh my goodness, his yields were about half that of the organic dry bean standard in Ontario. So no wonder he wasn't making any money. Um, he actually found an organic dry bean conference happening in Ontario, uh, took it, and realized what he needed to do in order to increase his yields, and he's doing much better now. But if you're farming in a bubble and you're, you're uh, maybe you're, you're just not, you know, not networked enough or maybe almost a little too nervous to, to share your results, um, get, you know, get past that and figure out uh, what other people are doing so that you can uh, always, always be increasing your, your uh, performance. Okay. Um, as far as planning tools go, uh, everybody's going to be different. Uh, you might be a spreadsheet person, you might be a pen and paper person, uh, you might be more of a visual person, and there's times where maps um, and sketches come in super handy. So we, you know, we have visual diagrams of our entire farm, um, but then I also have uh, all of my fields in spreadsheets, and I, I tend to work, do a lot of stuff in Excel. Um, there are a lot of, of programs that a lot of them like one is called veggie compass you can find that off of the farm link website um, there's so many of them now the farm planning software that uh, and if you are using one maybe type it in the in the chat box um, that that really kind of consolidate all of your planning into you know one program that might that might be something that you're really drawn to like I said I'm an Excel person I, I tend to work in Excel Timelines are great, um, you know, looking at your whole year in terms of uh, what you, what, well, cash flow would be one that we'll talk about in the future, but uh, your labor output. When, when do you see that, you know, a lot of labor is going to be required on your farm and when do you see that um, you have, have room to do more, for example. Um, then there's things like soil and water tests. Um, you, you might have forage tests that would fall in there as well, and then production records. So keep all of this. Uh, be very, very um, diligent in terms of, of your recording so that you have lots to assess for the following year. And the more you do that, the faster you're going to um, kind of climb that learning curve. If every year you're starting from scratch because you actually thought you could remember how that particular variety performed in the field, uh, you know, you're learning, you're going to climb up that learning curve a lot slower. Another great, um, another great book, this was published by the Canadian Organic Growers, is called Crop Planning uh, for Organic Vegetable Growers. A uh, very good uh, resource if you're, you know, if you're, if you're hearing me but you're not sure how to actually make these spreadsheets, uh, if you're a vegetable farmer, get the Crop Planning book. Uh, it's over the top in terms of its its planning files, uh, but if you're really starting out from scratch, that's uh, that's what you need. Okay, um, so there you go. Uh, this is one of the reasons why you want to be keeping records is to establish help you establish your cost of production. Um, you know, each crop might uh, have varying profitability in terms of time. Uh, so how much are you making per hour when you're growing tomatoes versus peas? Or how much money are you making on a per uh, acre basis with you know, buckwheat versus rye, or again, tomatoes versus peas, or, or what have you. Okay. Um, you know, for my various livestock, I can tell you which, uh, you know, which enterprise I'm making the most money at um, on a per hour basis, you know, no problem. If, uh, again, this is out of the crop planning for organic vegetable growers. This is a bit of a distillation of a lot of other um, record keeping files, but you can see when, when uh, you, you document the various varieties of what you're growing, the, what you've been selling them for, what your yields are uh, per bed, um, how much you're going to be making on a, on a per acre basis. Okay? So um, 
Miriam, I, if time um, permits, I'll, I'll definitely answer those questions at the end. And for all of you, if you have questions, type them in, and if I have time, we'll definitely go through them. Okay. Um, so your operation strategy has to be able to address um, your land needs, your labor needs, and your capital needs. Um, people get, I think, very excited about production from a what variety am I going to grow or what breed am I going to raise and how am I going to graze my animals like that's that's the exciting sexy stuff about farming uh, labor is not and if you're starting out you might think oh I'm never going to need help um, I really encourage you to think down the road what do you want your farm to look like in 10 or 15 years and build a farm business that um, will be able to grow in that direction Otherwise, if you think you're just always going to be a small little market garden and then one day you realize, oh, I'm not making any money, I just really, you know, <laughs> maybe I need to really expand, um, but now I don't have enough money to buy the, the necessary equipment to mechanize. Um, or I don't, I never thought about what housing might be required if I'm going to have on-farm staff, that, that kind of thing. Um, you got to take the long view and although it's maybe less exciting really make sure you're thinking about labor um, land and capital so I'm just gonna touch on labor a little bit um, there are if you know if you're being creative there are some options uh, in terms of how you will be uh, hiring people um, will you be paying people in a more of a contract way or will you have employees um, a lot of things can be just achieved through hiring somebody for custom work. So um, there's a lot of things that I don't do well uh, on my farm and I am only one person and I only have so many years left in my life and so I don't plan on uh, being able to do all of the electrical work on my farm, all of the construction work, all of the bookkeeping, all of the um, tractor maintenance and repair, so on and so on and so on. Uh, so I like to do what I am good at. You know, I'm good at marketing. I'm great with animals. I'm a good, um, t you know, task manager. And then I hire somebody else in to do my large-scale field work, um, to do uh, construction, those kinds of things. So I think about what you're really good at, and maybe think about paying somebody to do the stuff that you don't excel at. Um, now, um, do you have a business partner? And do you need a business partner? Um, you may find that you lack some of the, um, the skills necessary to be a good entrepreneur. If you've ever read The E-Myth, uh, it's an excellent book. Um, the E-Myth is the entrepreneurial myth or the, um, the false assumption that somebody who is good at doing the technical work of a business uh, will, will, ne will then be good at running that business. And running a business is a lot different than um, you know, just being out in your garden. So uh, maybe associating yourself with somebody with the necessary business acumen. Um, volunteers, interns are a little less um, reliable. Uh, I really enjoy working with interns, but I also have 15 years of experience that I can share with them. So uh, in, you know, keeping it or developing an internship program might be something you will consider for the long term. But if you're taking this webinar, it's probably a little too soon to be thinking about internships. Um, some people use their customer base as their labor base and so that's always an option. Do you have a spouse or children that you, you expect will be involved on the farm? Uh, you know, th that's a loaded kind of, you know, don't make assumptions and make sure that your uh, family members have clearly defined jobs for which they will be compensated for fairly. Um, that, yeah. Yeah, so just a couple of farms. I, I probably won't spend too much time in the interest of, of time talking about different farms, but um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, every farm has has a different labor strategy. Um, just really, you know, from what I've seen, there are very few farms, and I'm just talking about vegetables right now because they're the most labor intensive. Uh, if, you, if you plan on supporting yourself and, and paying all of your bills uh, and doing all the work by yourself, I would caution you uh, to think twice about that. I don't think that um, that a, a farm of that scale is necessarily going to be, uh, you know, if you have 
big financial goals, I'm not sure that you can meet them that way. And so you'll probably find that you actually do need to um, consider labor, like what your labor strategy is. And this is where um, getting back to your quality of life goals, your, um, your core values, what your strengths are, do you actually uh, want to manage people? The more, the bigger your farm is, the more managing you'll be doing, the less farming. Um, so those are important questions to, to kind of ask and, and put them through the filter of, of what your core values are, your, your quality of life goals, etc. Mm -hmm. If uh, when you're thinking about hiring, uh, five acts you can't ignore are listed there. And again, if you go to the FarmLink um, website, uh, you will be able to access all of these um, and, and get information on each one. All right, so uh, just in summary, uh, going back to the Farm Readiness Workbook, what was touched on there, make sure you set goals, make sure you choose products uh, that align with um, what's important to you, what you want out of life, make sure that you, uh, you know, and we'll get it into budgeting a bit more, but you want to make sure you're choosing things that are financially viable and, and fulfill you in, in all ways. Um, also remember that all of this production planning is done uh, hopefully to develop a business plan eventually, which you'll be producing not just for yourself, but um, for lenders down the road potentially. Do make sure you've taken the time to develop your production knowledge and your skills. So get your hands dirty um, if they have not yet been dirtied. Um, develop the habit of keeping production records so that you have the information you need for developing budgets um, and determining your, your cost of production. Uh, right from the beginning, make sure you have a human resources strategy. Make sure that you you uh, know who will be how you plan on having the labor performed on your farm, and if it's a family member, that those roles are clearly defined. Um, and like I said earlier, hire people to do the things you're not great at doing, because that can save you money. Um, and we did quite well. <laughs> uh, it's just about 10 to, so that's great. So the next webinar uh, is something I'm particularly passionate about is marketing. Uh, what I've learned over time is that it um, it is, you know what, and while I'm, I'm blathering on here, if you have a question, type it in right now so that I have a chance to look at them. I may not be able to answer every question, so I'm going to be picking the ones that I think are the most uh, broadly um, applicable to everyone. Um, yeah, so I've, I've learned that you can be a top-notch producer and you can you still may not succeed as a farmer unless you have a really effective marketing strategy. So uh, bear that in mind. Um, so sure, I have some, I'll just start with Miriam's question while we wait for other questions to come in, but to any surprises from my, my record keeping. Um, yeah, I, I uh, when I did my budgeting, my theoretical budgeting, I, I thought that um, pastured eggs were a really solid uh, enterprise, and then when I actually compared them to my records, my, you know, uh, I then learned that I am not making a lot of money from eggs, and uh, the, the difference is uh, the, the word marketable eggs. Uh, I yeah, we have fewer marketable eggs than I than I ever anticipated, and so that, that was what was changing my numbers. But I wouldn't have actually figured that out unless I was keeping good records. So, um, what am I making the most money at? Uh, and this is where it's interesting on a per hour basis. Um, I make the most money at uh, pastured pigs and chickens. However, I'm limited by things like quota in terms of how many of those of chickens I can produce. And in terms of pigs, I'm limited by how many I can sell. So even though those happen to be the most profitable on paper, uh, other factors are limiting me from um, having those being big money makers on my farm. So in the end, they're they're only moderate money makers. So, um, yeah, that I would say that's correct, Miriam. But I also got away from doing eggs for some quality of life purposes. Um, Every night having to schlep out to the back 40 to shut in my hens became, after 10 years, like something I just don't want to do anymore. <laughs> um, and the, the profit margin was low. And can only, I mean, we were charging, I forget, 650 at the end per dozen. And uh, 
I, it just wasn't worth, it was not something I want to do with my life anymore. So there you go. Um, what are the cons of a winter CSA? Winter. Uh, digging vegetables in late November and um, picking greens in one degree weather. Those are the cons. Also, uh, you have to charge a lot more or you should be charging more because uh, you say say you assume you lose 30 percent of your your uh, of every crop to you know disease or, or it's just not um, marketable what have you you're also going to have to budget for crop loss and storage and so um, say if I sold all of my onions as soon as I came out of the field I could sell 80 percent of my onions but if I have to uh, store them all winter long, that number might go down, right? Depending, it might be 50% in a really bad year. So, um, there you go. Uh, just curious if I found any strategies in reducing feed input costs for pigs and chickens. Yes, I've done, I've, I've had some great advances there, but I would say that those are two things I'm not going to get into today. I actually do teach a pastured pig workshop and a pastured poultry workshop. If you are anywhere near Ontario, um, uh, definitely uh, stay tuned to the Ecological Farmers Association of Ontario because um, I love to talk about pigs and chickens, but just not today. So. Are there any other questions? So, um, okay, so just a question regarding regulations for eggs. There are, and depending on what province you're coming from, you're going to have to check and find out who, who is the regulating body um, in your province. And um, FarmLink can hopefully help you with that. Here in Ontario, it would be the Egg Farmers of Ontario. Um, is that right? You can also go to getcracking.ca, <laughs> um, but yes, there are rules around uh, grading of eggs and farm gate sales, and you can't take your eggs to, a, say, a farmer's market without them being graded, uh, so there are definitely, definitely regulations. Uh, unless you have quota, you can only have 100 hens. That number is going to vary from province to province. Um, every province has some... Uh, has different regulations on supply managed commodities, which include turkey, eggs, uh, meat birds, and dairy. So, um, can I speak to associations like OFA versus Christian farmers? So, in uh, I suppose Canada wide, there's three farm organizations. They're called general farm organizations. Um, and maybe somebody can type these in so that everyone can see them, but it's the uh, National Farmers Union, the Christian Farmers Federation, uh-oh, this one's Ontario, but there's probably, in Ontario, it's the Christian Farmers Federation of Ontario, and I have a, I'm pretty sure it's also nationwide, and then there's um, the Canadian Federation of Agriculture, uh, so for me in Ontario, the it's the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. Each one is, um, those organizations, organizations exist to really support farmers on more of a political um, level. So they aren't organizations that are necessarily going to help teach you how to farm, but they're going to represent your interests. And so um, I, once you become a farmer, um, uh, uh, once your earnings in Ontario at $7,000, uh, you are invited to join one of those organizations. And I think it's really important to research those uh, figure out which one aligns with your interests and support them um, because they do a lot of really really good work. So that's that's what those are. Um, and sure. So it, um, there is a question about crop failures. Do I buy in product? So this would be. A question regarding vegetable production and um, what do I do if I have a crop failure? Uh, well, 
um, for CSA, which is a, a subscription program where people purchase uh, shares of produce in advance, um, the idea is that I'm expected to then produce enough vegetables to supply them with their the, everything they need uh, for the season. So in the winter from uh, November until March. And so what do I do if I have a crop failure? So there's a, a few different things. One is if it's, you know, uh, just a really, you know, there was a disease that wiped out a crop. Uh, part of a CSA is that members should, to a certain extent, be willing to bear the brunt of some of that loss. Um, so to an extent that, so for example, we had a, not a great garlic year and I still have a month left of my CSA and my members will be getting the last of their garlic uh, this week. So that's, that's how it goes. But we are having a great year for spinach. And so they're getting spinach every other week and they're thrilled. Um, do I buy in product? I do. If um, there are certain crops that I just know I will not be able to supply and they're an important crop, um, I have a budget for um, purchasing in a certain number of, of, uh, of products, I guess, uh, to supplement my CSA. Uh, so Jared, one example would be, to say to cap this uh, off? has nothing to do with crop failure, but I, I don't grow sweet potatoes. I live in Gray County. But I think it's really cool that we do have uh, organic sweet potatoes in Ontario, so I buy in some for my members. Um, okay, so it says that we have, are capping questions, so I think that means I should stop answering them. I think awesome. that's Thank you so much, Tara. It. Like maybe um, audience members, like yeah, let's just use our presenter box and uh, give Tara Hopefully a round of applause a, with some um, things. A good we need some really awesome farmer what? emoticons. I wish we could put that into Connect, but we're giving you like tractor shining hands. And um, thanks everyone for participating. Um, the next one is the marketing one, which uh, Tara mentioned, February 13th at 12 Eastern. Um, to sign up on the website if you're interested and basically. Um, it'll be the same sort of platform. So again, thanks today while we got everything sorted. It's been really awesome. We had about 50 people in the room and I'm delighted about that. And thanks so much, Tara, for sharing your time and to everyone across the country for your interest in farming and uh, Tara's knowledge. Yay, Tara. Thanks, farmers. Over and